Hello, welcome to the Oxfords, episode five. You may not enjoy this one, but we're going to give it a go. We're going to look back at the 2005-06 season, which doesn't end all that well without any spoilers in this. Uh, as usual, we have our usual guest, Dan Curtis. Daniel, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, welcome, everyone. Hello, Chris. Hello, Nathan. Welcome to Nathan as well. What a, what a great honour to have such distinguished company. Are you at me? That's kind, thank you. Yeah, nice season to, to make your debut on, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, we I couldn't find to... anyone else to talk about it. Yeah. Thanks. I did ask a couple of, well, you know, I asked three or four players from this season. They were reluctant to put their names to it, but Nathan, you are the jinx. So Nathan Cooper covered every game this season for the BBC Oxford? Yes, I would think so. Yes, no, definitely. Yeah. Definitely covered everything. Uh, meanwhile, Martin Brodetsky, the, oh. in between podcasts, something's happened to you, which we should alert the people who are only listening. What's happened to you there, Martin? Yeah, well, I thought to go with my lockdown haircut, I'd grow a lockdown beard. And so... Here I am, hairy of chops. So here we are, look, Chris Williams, Dan Curtis, Nathan Cooper and Uncle Albert, ready to talk about 2005-06. <laughs> uh, Dan, you are the man who steers uh, this programme. What have you got to start us off? Well, funnily enough, the first thing we've got is uh, a quick question from Martin's ever popular quiz. Yeah, my, my easy quizzes that everyone likes. When you say um, ever popular? <laughs> well, in his family. Right. Well, well, with me. My family don't like it either. <laughs> so, uh, so everyone who's listening on the podcast or watching this, so make sure you've got a notebook and pen handy because uh, this first question is actually one for you to think about throughout the whole sort of uh, podcast. So I'm not going to give any answers just yet. But basically, in this season, 2005-06, that we're looking at, there are 11 sides in League Two then that are no longer in the Football League. So just easy one, name those 11 sides. I've also got a corollary question uh, let's go alongside it. A what question? Um, He's had a, a corollary question, question. A supplementary question, if you like. No. Oh. Because uh, uh, I'm aware that, um, for example, Dan has already seen these questions because he made the slides. So this one's so that he can have something to think about as well. But uh, the corollary supplementary question, which is worth eight points, <laughs> which sides are now in League Two that weren't in the Football League in 2005-06? Oh. How long do we do these podcasts? Because this might take me three hours just to get that bit. <laughs> it's to think about throughout the whole programme. Which sides were not in League... Were now in League Two that weren't in the EFL back then? I hate you. Yeah. I could. So that's for 19 points, is that right, Martin? Uh, for those two questions, yeah. The, the supplementary one is a voluntary one, obviously. You don't, I won't count those towards the total. Well, maybe I will. We'll see. Well, while, while we're... Um... We'll write down a few answers. Martin, set the scene for the good people at home. Where were we in the summer of 2005? OK, we weren't in that bad a position, to be fair. Um, the previous season, of course, was the one that saw lots of uh, upheaval. Quite exciting, quite extraordinary scenes, really, when uh, Graham Ricks was uh, sacked and uh, the club brought in Ramon Diaz and the, uh, the rest of his uh, Italian stroke Argentinian crew. Um, and they uh, had some exciting games under them, uh, but they didn't last till the end of the season. Very final game of the season, before, or just before the final game of the season, they were uh, unceremoniously dumped. And uh, David Oldfield took charge of that final game, at which was announced Brian Talbot as the new manager to start, uh, start of 2005-06. But uh, we, we finished our season in 15th place, which... Uh, you know, it's a kind of respectful mid-table position. We're never in danger of going down, never in danger of troubling the playoffs, really. Uh, just steady, you know, steady as she goes, middle of the table season, that one. And then we come into 2005-06 with Brian Talbot in charge. Um, and he brought in a few players, including... Uh, he'd just come from Russian Diamonds. He brought in some of his uh, old mates from Russian Diamonds, notably Billy Turley. And uh, and that's kind of uh, where we were at the start of the season. He is the love of my life, Billy Turley. Yeah, and everyone else's. Yes. Um, the season they... started on a glorious sunny afternoon by the sea in Grimsby. Oh, I'm the only person ever to wear shorts in Grimsby. I wore shorts to this game. It's the only, forget the football, only person ever to wear shorts in... Well, Cle footballers. Cleethorpes. Nathan <laughs> would have been there. Nathan's got a better memory than me. Who got been here, eh? from holiday that morning? I remember landing being delayed really late from I think it was Portugal had been to us. Sort of literally landed and came straight up. But it was a short sleeves day or shorts for you, wasn't it? It was a lovely afternoon. 
And of course, United went behind, didn't they? Uh, they did early on. Just one win in the last 20 years. It seems you can't usually expect too much from Grimsby on the opening weekend. But when Tony Crane's really second scrappy half game, as I recall, they might just have been thinking the hoodoo could be over. Well, I wasn't at that game. I was in the south of France on holiday. Chris Hargreaves, born in Cleethorpes, denied them victory. This is an interesting one for me because I, I was at this game. Um, I was watching it, but I must admit, I was watching the cricket score on my phone at the time because it was the third day of the second Ashes Test. One at Edgbaston that went down to the fight, went down to the wire. But I'm absolutely convinced, this is how memory plays tricks. I was convinced that goal was scored in front of our fans, but watching it there, it definitely wasn't. And there's no way I was in the home end. So that just shows how memory plays tricks. That was Chris Hargreaves scoring, yeah. who was one what of the new signings. Yeah. And he impressed. was from Grimsby, wasn't he? I think. He's, yeah, he, he started out there as a striker in their uh, youth team. I'm impressed you had a mobile phone in 2005, did that? <laughs> Always at the cutting edge of technology, Chris. Yeah, I can see that by the footage here. Yes, that's good. <laughs> the footage is really interesting. There is very, very little on YouTube from this season. I mean, I have scoured, and I do want to give uh, Jim Hendo, Jim Henderson, a big kind of big up because he's done a great job of collating lots of archive. If you don't follow him on YouTube, you should do because it's a really, really good source. But there is very, very little from this season. Mm. I mean, what we've got here is literally all there is. So. I'm Probably a reason for that. Hargreaves coming out after that game, we spoke to him in the press box there, and the usual sort of footballing cliches for interviews are about, you know, a bit of character from this team, coming back from a goal down, scrapping out a point for Grimsby first day of the season, you know, good start to the campaign. At that point, you know, you're thinking, yeah, there's a bit of grit about this side, but know-how, and all will be all right. I remember watching the warm-up thinking, God, we look like quite a good team. The warm-up looked really, really good. They were fizzing the ball about, the crosses were being whipped and everything was hitting the back of the net. I was thinking, yeah, this could be a good season. But the next game, of course, had a great goal, didn't it? Because that was the, the home run over Torquay. Here we go. You're, you're a bit at this, mate. Welcome. At the <laughs> There's somebody who knows that. One goal to show for their efforts. <laughs> Lee Bradbury's overhead kick, though, <laughs> worth the admission fee. Roof. Bradbury's first goal since January. It's been for those the listening, there's a cracking overhead volley from, uh, from Lee Bradbury from close range. Who I saw it's on the TV. The season, really? He's um, Crawley Town's assistant manager or first team coach. Brad is now. One of the big problems that season, they were scoring goals, wasn't it? I mean, that's a brilliant goal from Bradbury. And we'll probably get into him later in, in, in the hour. But Steve Basham got double figures. I think Saban got close. But I mean, again, probably getting a bit later. But come January, we're looking for strikers. And we end up going in the non league to try and score goals to stay in the Football League and United having lost, was it Mooney that season had gone, hadn't he, Martin? And it just That's didn't right, get yeah. Martin. Uh, Mooney left at the start of the season, went to Wickham. Uh, so, yeah, there were, there, we, had, we had some cycles on the books, but again, as we'll come on to later in the show, uh, we lost a few of those in the January transfer window. Nathan and Chris, you're both obviously like, really close to the club and have been for years and years. What kind of vibes do you get from a season? You know, early on in the season, do you know whether it's going to be a good season or not? Pre-season is always difficult, isn't it? We've all fallen down the pre-season route before of thinking, yeah, this is going to be all right, what a good side. And you know, we've all made predictions based on pre-season. It's hard early on to put too much stock on what's I was saying in the Grimsby game, we're all thinking, yeah, a bit of Garrett, a bit of grit. And as you're saying, Dan, watching the warm-up look, looking good. It often takes, you know, a, a couple of months, I think, to really work out but I have spoken to a couple of players. I know, Chris, you want to get a few, and I spoke to a couple in the week before this, you know, sort of off the record, and one or two of them were sort of saying we were a little bit worried even quite early on in that season about the makeup of the squad, you know, how it might come about. Um, they hadn't given up on the season, don't get me wrong. There was no one going, oh, that's it, we're down. But I think, you know, the players themselves had a little suspicion that perhaps the, the depth of the squad wasn't quite going to be enough that season. Back, back in those days, Nathan and I used to travel to the games. There's a little media car and we used to go to games. I used to pick him up and go. Nathan's always slightly, who doesn't actually work for the club, can be a little bit more down on the players and can see the dark side of it. I have to think we're going to win every game or, I, I, or, I, or there's no point doing my job. But there is a game later in the season where I didn't think we were going to win. I will tell you when alarm bells started ringing for me. And I have to be careful because I still work for the club. How we selected our captain for this season was based on a treasure hunt that Brian Talbot put in place. They went off in, I think it was six different cars. 
whichever car got to the treasure hunt first, which was the Red Lion at Tetsworth, then whoever was driving the car became captain for the season. Alarm <laughs> bells, alarm bells. Was, who was the captain there? It was Chris Hargraves, wasn't it? Or... He was the captain. Um, he's, he's, quite, he's quite a kind of captain-like figure, isn't he? He was always going to be the captain. He was the only one who could read a map, so he was... He was always... <laughs> I think he came across, didn't he, as a got a sergeant major sort of character. He was very keen. All the players had to all wear the track suits all the time. There was flip flops in the showers to to make sure no one slipped over or passed any infections on. The outside looking, he he gave that persona of being quite a, a hard taskmaster. He wasn't with all the players like that. He was with some, with others he was he was a lot softer on, and. I, I don't think he was, you know, he came, as you said, from Rushton, you know, he had a bit of success. The time at Oldham wasn't quite so good. From the outside looking in, you're thinking this is a, you know, the sort of manager Ox are going to need after, after Ricks and after the Diaz experiment. Obviously proved to be completely the wrong, the wrong appointment at the time. But I think looking from the outside in, the way that he conducted himself and the way he wanted things to be done behind the scenes was probably right at the time. He's a nice man as well, Brian. He's, he, he could be very strict with people, but he was funny as well. And, at the, at the point of the season we're talking here, everyone wanted it to work, and I thought it would work for him, to be honest. Um, so I'm going to take control of this this uh, program again because we've had a little break where we had an edit. There will be no product placement going on here, will there, Dan? Mm, no. what a lovely cut. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so Bradbury scores a goal against Torquay, and we've actually started quite well here. And, and there's no, you know, the season is still full of promise at this stage. I think. I think so. Talking of promise, let's have um, let's have a quick question, Martin. Yeah, should be hopefully relatively simple one. Uh, from which club did Lee Bradbury join Oxford? So there you go. He scored no head against Torquay, but where did he come from before he was at Oxford? Is that a trick question? Um, I don't think it's meant. It's not meant to be. I hate you. Well, all these questions are very easy if you know the answers. A good point. But on with the show. Um, yeah, as I said, we were doing okay. Um, we're doing not okay. We were doing really well. I, in researching this program today, I thought let's get some league tables from various points in the season. And there are various websites where you can find out exactly what the league table was after certain numbers of games. Um, this we are after thirteen games, a quarter of the season. We are sick. And everything's looking good. Only two defeats, five wins. But you can see already there, one of the problems is the goal difference. Yeah. Two sides of the top nines, elevens. Well, we talked about not scoring goals. United struggled to keep them out that season as well, didn't they? Which is a recipe for disaster, isn't it? And for younger fans, that's how the season ended. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> There's so little footage from this season. Um, but there are little bits. This is a this is a game away at Torquay. I'm thinking this is kind of mid October, November. Um, one of the best goals ever seen. The footage doesn't quite do it justice. Eric Saban ran the length of the field. They may be bottom of the football league, but there's no shortage of entertainment in Torquay matches, especially at home. Eric Sabin gave Oxford the lead yesterday after just that was an minutes. unbelievable goal. I, I have seen it in full before. Um, and it's was in by Adam Lockwood. The frantic pace continued throughout the first half. Look at what I was playing for that, because it's obviously at, at the seaside and weekend away, wasn't it? Lee Bradbury, the scorer. And they made it 3-1 as Sabin scored his second of the game and eighth of the season. Thanks largely to a terrible goalkeeping... We're 3-1 up Andrew at this point. Marriott. And still only 19 minutes... And that would have been a really, really good away win because Torquay was one of the teams the who were struggling. scored their second through Kevin Hill. Turkey's previous two home league matches it ended in a 4-3 defeat and a 3-3 draw and there was just one more goal yesterday scored by Hill it ended 3-3 that's 19 goals in three home matches Nathan you were there I'm guessing you've never yeah. missed the game um what what was the mood like after that one yeah that's a sickness because I mean, you see again that they're, they're bad goals to give away you leave you score three goals away from home you expect to win the game don't you you really do and um, that's, that was a real kick in the teeth because, as you say, Torquay, I think they're there for the taking that day as well. Scored good goals, but the goals they've given away, watching them back, brings back horrible memories of that sort of game. It encapsulates the season. They could not 
defend well enough. And, you know, that comes to pass come the end of the season. But you, you talk about that, you know, you win that game, you stay up. We're going to come to the Stockport game later on. You get a point there. You stay up. It's very easy sometimes. We all go scenes of goal. If we've done that and we've done this, it's all very different. But this season, there are two or three absolute clear-cut games where you're not talking this buts and maybes. You're actually saying, see the game out there. You know, if it goes the season that has it done after that, you still stay up. And then they are, that's not at all, if he's not given a penalty, it might have been handball sort of moment, is it? That's a, we're two clear goals up away from home and still come back with a point. I remember being annoyed at throwing away, you know, two points during this game. Um, but I don't remember being worried. I wasn't worried at all by this point in the season. Um, I went to this one as well, actually. This was just after Christmas. Um, and we won, and Chester was just embarking on a terrible run. After four consecutive defeats, Chester's lack of confidence was again all too evident, this time at home to Oxford. Barry Quinn's powerful run resulted in Adam Griffin sending in a goal-bound effort. Keeper John Ruddy could only parry the ball into the path of Steve Basham. I'm somewhere on that terrace jumping around like a mad That was That was the last win, wasn't it? Under Brian Tolbert. And there's ten games after that before you won again, and that was... For when uh, Darren Patterson had the the, uh, the home win, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, against Bristol Rovers, yeah. Yeah. We are literally just about to embark on this kind of horror run. Starting off with a, I think it's a New Year's Day possibly, um, a home drubbing by Shrewsbury, who weren't a particularly good team. They were kind of down the bottom half of the table. Um, highlights to just a bit unlucky in the first half. Any memories, anyone? I wasn't at this one. I remember that one. Brian, it was obvious, Nathan mentioned the defensive frailties, but we weren't scoring goals. You can see here, like, I mean, we don't score any in this game, but we weren't, we we'd stopped. And uh, Brian wanted to bring in a striker because he knew the limitations. But nobody wanted to come. Nobody, they could see the predicament we were starting to get into. We weren't particularly challenging at the top by then. There were other clubs at the top who were snapping up players. I was in the office with Brian Talbot because Kazan rang him and said, I don't care what it takes. We want a challenge for promotion. You can pay up to £5,000 a week, which, remember, this is a long time ago, and you can pay whatever fee you want to get the striker to come to this club to, to get us back to where we should be. Um, and he couldn't get any... In the, I don't know how much he paid in the end, but he got Tim Sills from Aldershot, so... It wasn't the star name striker that Perros wanted him to get. Was that the beginning of the end, do you think? If a manager can't sign the players he wants to sign, is that a sign that maybe the, the managers... I don't think it was not wanting to play for Brian. I think it was just... I don't know whether it was reputation or we didn't look after players. I don't know what it was. But he could not get a player to come in. And about this time, the whole takeover was rumbling too, isn't it, behind the scenes yeah, as well? Yeah, that's part is... of it as well. You know, whether all of it's in public at the time or not, in, in football circles, people know about these things and players can be very reticent sometimes. Well, if I go now and the and takeover happens in, you know, a couple of months and a new manager comes in, what's my future then? I'm not going to go and move the family up to expensive part of the world. You in Oxford to find in three or four months' time, maybe I don't fit the new manager's plan. So I think that takeover behind the scene that was rumbling on and was probably needed at that point as well. I mean, Chris makes a good point that the Firoz Kassam at that point was offering the cash and you know, do what needs to be done, but it hadn't always been that way at United. And that kind of feels like almost a parting shot in many ways. You go, well, look, I'm, I'm off soon, but my legacy is this fantastic striker. And that could have been very different. If if you get a player in that whacks in a load of goals that season, United go up and Firoz Kassam had gone, that's a very different legacy that he leaves the football club. If he says, look, my last act was to find out signing whoever it might be, that probably changed a lot of people's reaction because it's not long after this that people are sort of still in the boardroom, isn't it? So that's Uncle Albert, you're you're sat there. We've been talking um, about what goes on on the pitch. What's been the, the, what's happening with the ownership of the club at this stage? Where are we, Dan? About January time. This is January, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't long before there was a uh, fans forum, I remember, at the Kassam Stadium, of Firoz Kassam addressed the multitude. And the one thing that he stated quite explicitly at that time because uh, there's lots of rumours obviously bubbling up about the imminent sale of the club, was that he said he would not sell the club without the stadium. Um, but as we know, uh, things didn't work out like that. Um, there was the, the Woodstock Partners Limited were the 
the consortium that were looking to buy the club. Um, at this stage, I don't think that was known. I think that that kind of came out later. But uh, everyone knew that Kassam was prepared to sell. And uh, at this time, everyone thought that he was prepared to sell the whole lot, lock, stock and barrel. So there were the assets for the new owner. At this point as well, I went in, I don't know, about 10 to 9 one morning. And coming out of um, Mick Brown's office was Nick Merry, who used to play in our youth team. Uh, and there were rumours that he was interested in buying and stuff. And the, as it turns out, Mick Brown used to go out with Nick Mary's sister or the other way around. Nick Mary's sister used to go out with Mick Brown, which I don't know who I feel most sorry for in that relationship. But somebody went out with somebody's sister, so they were mates. But clearly he was doing a little bit of homework to see behind the scenes and what he was about to buy. So there were pretty strong rumours around then of, of what was happening. But it all mel melded in, melded? It all molded into one, didn't it? That you've got the team struggling on the pitch, rumours of a takeover off it. And I think um, Bill Smith and Brendan Cross turn up to take some pressure off for Oz in the boardroom. It was starting to become a bit of a mess by now. I think as well, I think the club, everything about the club was just feeling a bit stale. Maybe it's just my relationship with it. I was going through quite a kind of, an on-off relationship with the club for the first time in my life. This is a team I've supported for 20 years and I couldn't really be bothered. I think it'd been like six or seven seasons of pretty disappointing football is the kind of the, the relegation from the championship, then uh, the relegation down again. Um, then we had the kind of slightly dour years of the, the uh, you know, Kemp and Atkins style football. I think everyone at the club was just a bit kind of stale really and um things were kind of not maybe there just wasn't a good feeling coming from the club at the time maybe people could sense that we hadn't been a winning team for a long time i mean put a point for discussion for you three then because i can't really comment on that but the promise of taking us on a journey was that 2000 2001 mm -hmm. we're now five yeah. years on and the journey isn't going where we all wanted it to be is that part of the the fan resentment Possibly. I think, you know, there was new, there was real excitement when the stadium finally was being, was nearing completion. And there's a kind of sense of, yeah, finally, we've got a new ground. And then the ground didn't prove to be what we're kind of hoping it to be. You know, it's three-sided. Um, it didn't have the kind of brilliant atmosphere. It obviously been done, not if not on the cheap, you know, it certainly wasn't the lavish stadium that certainly the, the early plans predicted it was going to be. Um, and then, you know, there was a talk of, are oh, you going to get a team to be proud of? And then, you know, we, the team kind of threatened a couple of times to get into the playoffs and never quite managed it. And then by now, everything was just getting a bit, oh, do you know what I mean? It, just, it wasn't a great time. There's a couple of close points there, isn't there? Obviously, you've got the, the Diaz months was very exciting to watch as a fan and to report on as well. It was just some crazy football and some crazy times. You know, you talked about the Atkins football and it's probably not a very popular opinion, but... I still think Ian Atkins gets a lot of stick unnecessarily. It may not have been everyone's cup of tea, but they were pretty, pretty close. And I wonder if, if Thoros Kassam says to Ian Atkins, not on for he goes, what he says to Brian Tolbert, getting a player on Atkins was desperate to strengthen that squad when they're on the cusp of doing something good. And it didn't happen. They had the FA Cup run. When they got the Arsenal game, I think he expected the reward for the players, a trip abroad or something nice. That wasn't forthcoming. It felt then like it was... It wasn't all good behind the scenes at that point. And, I, and whilst I'm not saying Ian Atkins guarantees you fantastic football and a great journey from there, United were very close there and they got that very, very wrong. And it, I, um, it, was Bradbury. Was on. it was Bradbury again, wasn't it? Because yeah. Atkins wanted to sign Lee Bradbury to strengthen his forward positions already with Allsop and Basham and a few players scoring goals. And Feroz wouldn't let him do it then. So Lee Bradbury is entwined with all this. Um. What happened next then, Martin? So we're, we're in January and we're expecting yeah. to buy players. And what happens instead? Well, there's, uh, we lose these three quite key players, or, or good forward players. Obviously, uh, Chris Hackett and Craig Davis were sold. We won't tell you who to, because that's the question coming up. Um, Lee Bradbury was uh, let go. I'm not sure if he was let go or if he just left because uh, they weren't playing him anymore because of... Uh, a clause in his contract whereby if he played one more game, he triggered a contract extension. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we lose these three players and uh, suddenly we 
a team that didn't score many goals in the first place, we suddenly lost all our firepower, really, in one fell swoop. I mean, Davis has been in at the side that year, hadn't he? Craig Davis was a very exciting talent, but he hadn't really settled. Chris Hackett obviously was a big loss. But the Bradby situation, again, sums up what's going on behind the scenes. You've got a player who clearly is quite important to the club. Again, wasn't everyone's cup of tea all the time, but he was a very, very good player, Lee Bradbury, and the people around him appreciate him perhaps more than people on the outside sometimes. And you've got the situation, and Brian Tobit telling us an interview one, one day after an away game, he said, I, I want to pick him, but I can't anymore because of the contract situation. And when you get into that sort of moment, that, I think, sounds alarm bells as well. It must, it must be terrible for the other players as well, thinking, well, you know, this player's being frozen out. You know, because if he plays once more, he's going to get a contract extension. You know, how much do I trust this club to look after me in the future? I mean, you know, it must have had an unsettling effect, I think. I, I'm not convinced about that. Uh, I think players are a bit more, not all of them, but I think players are a bit more mercenary. Oh, he's not in the side, I'll get my chance. I, uh, I can see both sides of that. And of course, sometimes players put these clauses in or agents, it backfires. It's backfired for Bradbury there in many ways, but it, you think it shouldn't do. The club at that stage probably needed him more than they needed to worry about the, you know, the contract of the following season, perhaps. But, it, you know, players themselves have those things put in contracts and it sometimes can come back to bite them as well as bite the club, can't it? I just remember thinking when the, all three players left, I just remember thinking that leaves that leaves us really short up front. And I was starting to really worry where the goals were going to come from. As Nathan said earlier, we weren't scoring many goals this season. And then to lose, you know, your pacey winger, your promising young striker, and the bit of know-how that you've got up front in one, in one transfer window. I remember thinking alarm bells, definitely. Martin, who did we replace them with? Um, well, there's Tim Seals already on, on the scene. I can't remember now, but uh, certainly uh, we went to... Having played uh, Eastley in the FA Cup, we came back with uh, Yemi Odubadi. No, he had to come back and play the replay before we saw oh, the replay, yeah. We made sure he played against us, then we got him. Yeah. Uh, Tim Sills came in, and a lad called Neville Roach uh, arrived as well. Um, yeah, they, tried, yeah. sorry, on, they tried Scott Fitzgerald as well. He came in, didn't he, for, yeah. for a short loan. They were trying all these players to score goals to get you out of this division who were not of that division's quality necessarily. Roach had been all right at non-league level, he scored goals. Yemi had got pace to burn. And Tim Sills, actually when he signed, you went, well, OK, he has got a proven goal-scoring record with Aldershot, albeit you're talking about a player making the jump from non-league to football league at a time when you haven't really got time to, to settle or adapt. It's come and score goals now. We can't be worried about next season. This is about scoring goals now. I felt a bit for Tim Sills from that point of view because he was the one in the end who they could get to, to fill that void. And maybe it wasn't, he might be the right player at the wrong time. Yeah, there's the question that goes with that graphic. So, uh, which teams did Bradbury, Hackett and Davis join after leaving Oxford? Or upon leaving Oxford, as it says there. So again, quite a simple one if you know the answers. Which teams did Bradbury, Hackett and Davis join after they left Oxford United? I just say I love all three of those. I, I'm still friends with the three of those. Craig in particular is hilarious, but he had, I'm going to give a clue. He had a really amazing move, right? Yeah. Well, I've just written down a country, but it's actually the wrong country. So without giving, <laughs> no, you wouldn't know it anyway. So, yeah, come on. What happened after this? So, uh, oh. Uh, oh. Wow. Right, I'm going to say something I shouldn't as the Oxford United press officer. Nathan will back this up. I was leaving before kickoff when the team news came in. I had to be persuaded to stay and watch the game. Correct me? Correct. You came round. Remember, we were waiting for you to come round the pitch and your, your head's down. And we're thinking he's either, you know, having a laugh with all sorts of something. And you came round and you said you won't guess the team. And we yeah. all tried. And you get the usual bit. You get the keeper and you go yes and this, that. And you get to left back and you go no, no. And we go. But it's Ben Whedon playing there, and you went, no, on the bench. You went, it's Andy Burgess. And then from that point on, we found out Brooks, he's coming in. Jane Brooks came back, then he for his first game, and he was nowhere near ready. He wasn't he wasn't fit, and it was it was a horror show. An absolute horror show. But endured a nightmare return to Nen Park as his former side wrapped up the match in the opening quarter of the game. Three goals. So for those listening on the podcast, the this is uh, the away game at Rushland Diamonds when uh, 
we got beat 3 nothing. First career goal plays superbly. Although yeah, three Chris goals in seven minutes wasn't the ball midway point in the first half. Diamonds had started the day bottom. Happy say I wasn't there. But they soon added a second and goal against the Jews. Just the context. This is rushed in with being bottom all season. Tony Stokes free kick. And that's Mark Chris Kelly scoring twice, who would later come to Oxford United and Gulliver's and be another sign that people forget very very quickly. But who this was a very talented player. According to the this commentary on this, Hunter, I listened to this earlier, this, this, these were his first goals in 51 matches. And, and he got two. Attacking the field trainer. That's ended the scoring, but Oxford with four former Rushton players this in their side were reduced to ten. Yes, yeah. so to go. because of my frustration John before the game, I actually had a bit of a set to with the Rushton press officer in the press box. They oh, received oh. a straight red on his debut. Did, didn't they? Because Haskin. they got up and applauded that Dexter tackle, and I wasn't having it. Challenge, and so uh, it's very rare that you see things in the press box. But I was very much on the Dempster's side. Is Andy Burgess? Is Rushton's all-time record appearance holder having his leg almost broken by Darren Kasky. So I took umbrage at that and there were angry scenes in the press office, which luckily I said, hold my coat and somebody held me back. It was fine. probably Nathan. Did you get a straight red as well, Chris? I, um, no, I was bigger than him. I won that one. So, um, <laughs> I'll hold your coat for you. There's very much an unwritten press box rule, isn't there, when it comes to celebrating in bits and pieces. Yeah. We've all occasionally clenched a fist under a table or even maybe stood up in a moment when a yeah, big goal's gone in a playoff semi-final or something, but you don't... There are a few clubs who are guilty of it, even now, I won't get into that, but there are one or two who really let themselves down, and it's very much... It's rude way of putting it, it's like a non-league mentality, where you've got people in a press box shouting out at referees and it doesn't matter if you're a fan or not that's not the place if you want to do that then you know you go and you enjoy the game from the terrace there's a little bit of professionalism call it what you like that has to go in with that privilege of being there and to applaud that that time i remember it really really well looking around because we were sat in front as i looked around i heard him shouting through the glass and i saw what happened subsequently but you can tell how bad it was because that's david oldfield at the end of the um footage and if he's getting wound up and shouting at somebody it's bad because he's a very placid He's a great football man. He, he is. He obviously wants to win, but you don't see him losing his rag like that. And that was a horrible, horrible tackle. Nate, if me and David Olfield are on our feet in people's faces like that, it must have been a bad tackle, right? Yeah, it was. I didn't need you to, to get angry about that. We were getting angry on the radio about it. It was a terrible tackle. And obviously John Dempster, on his debut, gets his former club, gets himself sent off. And that's somebody else missing for the next couple of games, isn't it? When United now are, are struggling badly. Oh, what a season this is. What, what happens next? Please tell us yeah. something good. So I, I just wonder what well what did happen next? You know, what, what was the reaction afterwards to that performance? I honestly can't remember. I remember the press area was over the far side, and I think Nathan might have a better memory. I have no idea what was said after it. Chris, I haven't. I've got that tackle and your altercation, and the, the moment before the game with the team sheet. Whether after that you sort of you blank it out, I don't know. But I cannot. I've had some things at Rushton, actually. There's several things from that ground that I always remember. Um, many of them are bad. Uh, but that <laughs> conversation after the game, is, I, I would love to tell you what Brian Talbot said and how he justified it. I honestly can't. Maybe he couldn't. I'll tell you another Rushton story, Dan, if you want. We went there once and Sam Deering uh, played. And Sam, in the interview, repeated what I said as his answers. So I said, Sam, we showed some character to come back. And Sam said, yeah, we showed some character to come back. I said, it was important after we lost the previous game. Yeah, it was important after we lost the previous game. And he did it for six questions. Was that a joke? Was that that was a rush from the Diamonds. Terrible club. You should have stitched him up. Yeah. That's your media training right there, Chris. Oh, okay. Martin's answered his own question. Good, I've got a point here. Yeah, great. Well, Nathan answered this one, isn't it? Uh, two players made their debuts for Oxford at Russian Diamonds, and one player made his final appearance for the club. So name the three players. Basically. Nathan's given you one of them already. I don't mind. I've given you the other one. Okay, you give me the other one. So there you go. One player made his final appearance for the club. Yeah, so name those three players. It wasn't long after the Rushton game that... Uh, changes were made. In fact, there's there's one other game that I cannot find footage of that proved to be Brian Talbot's last match in charge. And that was the fateful game at Stockport that Nathan referenced earlier, 
Um, <laughs> yeah. cannot find footage. If anyone's got footage of it, send it through. Um, and because it's, I mean, it's such a pivotal game in the season. Nathan, what happened in that Stockport game? Yeah, it, it does exist. I'm sure. I've, I'm sure I've seen it. Um, I can't remember when, but I remember seeing it not long ago for something. I spoke to um, uh, another podcast not that long ago talking about commentary and bits and pieces because there's a line in that game that I never forget, and it's one of those ones where you you should remember all your you know great goals and were scoring you, you, these moments. The, the Stockport game, I was with Nick Harris and we're doing the commentary, and it's one all, and Tim Sills I think he scored his first goal for the club. And it's literally the last few minutes and uh, Bramble went down the outside and they put a ball in behind Ashton, who's chasing him in the penalty area. And I remember clear as day just saying, don't foul him, don't foul him, don't foul him. He's fouled him and it's a penalty. And that was, when we talked about the Torquay game, the stop put one for me. You don't blame John Ashton. If you look at that goal on its own, you'd go, what a daft tackle. But Chris will tell you, Martin, as well, the way that, Clubs work now behind the scenes with analysis. Any goal that's scored, they now work it back. And you go, and it's his fault, but they can show you for all the players usually who've not done what they should do the way they analyse football now. But at that time, you look on its own, you go, that's a stupid tackle from John Ashton. Doesn't need to do that. But United did get caught out badly at one all. They should be seeing the game out and not letting Bramble run in behind. Stockport scored the penalty. They win that 2-1. If that finishes one all, United stay up. Because Stockport have two points off their total. United get one more. They finish levelling on points. And Oxford's goal difference, surprisingly, was actually better than Stockport. But that moment, I can see it now so clearly looking out and watching Ashton getting turned and just thinking he's going to... And it came out, you know, almost that fan thing, don't foul him. And he did. I was reading, sorry for the product placement, I was reading Chris Hargreaves' book about this season and he talks about the penalty incident. He actually says it was a back pass, but I think his, his memory is a bit skewed. It's definitely a, it was a penalty. Um, and he talks about the, the scenes afterwards in the changing room and how, um, I think everyone, he says that everyone kind of knew that that was Talbot's last minutes in charge. And, you know, basically his, his death knell was that, that dive in by Ashton. Um, again, That's any memories from after the game? That was the one, sorry, Chris, that was the one I think when we were starting to worry seriously looking in. There'd been worries before, but that was when you went, right, now we really are in a dogfight. And I'm glad you mentioned Chris's book, because I'd actually written down about that. His interview afterwards with Nick was brilliant. He came out and he absolutely laid everything on the line. He laid into the club. He's everyone from, he's, I think his quote was from the chairman down to the tea lady, you know, it's a bloody shambles or something like that. And he was absolutely right. And absolutely furious and that's when you, you drive away from a game myself and Nick heading back that day down the motorway just saying you know, now this is real and this is this is a worry that is a catastrophic result for United. How it works with people at home is after the game I will go in and talk to the manager and say who wants to who should we get to do the interview but on days like that there was no stopping Greaves he would be out and heading for the interview before you even got into the dressing room because he wanted to talk about it. He would phone me up in the week and say, Chris, what the, is going on off the pitch? We'd talk about it in for hours into the night and stuff. But I remember him coming out to do that and I thought, oh God, we're in trouble. I didn't used to have to do interviews like that. I'd just take notes and stuff. So poor Nathan you, you used to cop for it sometimes if we were bad. Brian, I think, was quite... You can tell when a manager's going. You can tell in, in, in the interviews, you know. He's... He was very good. I would, wouldn't want to play poker with Brian Talbot because I think he um, held himself together quite well, but he knew in his heart, I think. So Brian left a couple of days later, didn't he, on, on the Tuesday. Um, Darren Patterson took over, who'd been manager of the youth team, quite a successful manager of the youth team at the time. Describe Darren to us, Chris. Brilliant bloke. Absolutely love Darren. Still talk to him a lot. Um, had his career cut short from an injury when we moved to the Kazam, he'd, he'd, he'd done his best to keep us up in that horrible 100 goals against season. He'd played his heart out. He was the one who tried. Everybody behind the scenes was completely backing him um, to, to be a success. And Feroz was ready to give him the money, he said. But Feroz was still talking to people about buying the club. Darren knew it as well. Um, during Darren's reign, he was a bit unlucky, wasn't he, Nate? Because I think it's his third game when we go to Bury, and there's a change of owner on that day. 
I think there's two things about that. I think, Chris, what he says there, you know, he said Darren's a great bloke, and I think Darren Patterson gets a rough stick from fans because there's this assumption that he often used, you know, great bunch of lads, great bloke. He was, but that did not make him necessarily a bad manager. And I, I think I share the opinion that if he had kept the job for the end of that season, he would have kept United up because he knew that group of players. He knew the ones you could rely on and the ones you needed. And he got them playing. They beat Rovers on the Tuesday night and they got draws at Notts County and at Berry. They don't sound like great results, but that, that was points on the board after a terrible run of results. And I don't know if I'm right in saying, Chris, and you'll confirm this. I don't know if we can name the player or not, but the Berry game. Yeah. Steve, can I name him? Yes, go on. So Steve Claridge has is virtually signed for the club. He's got Claridge in. The shirt is printed up, isn't it? Yeah. Ken Ridley. They're going to pick him up on the way. And that gets pulled because the deal's about to go through. There's other players who I'd heard as well that he had yep. lined up. I don't know if any of those were true or not, but one at least was a former Oxford midfielder who would have been, I think, a good signing as well at that stage, just settled things down. But Claridge was definitely done and dusted. And that's a player, all right, love him or hate him, the sort of player you're going to need over those next few games of relegation dogfight to roll his socks down, roll his sleeves up and, and help you out a bit. And that deal was done and it got pulled just before that game because, well, during the game, the news broke, didn't it? No, oh, all the way all the way up there, again, earlier on, I said me and Nathan would travel. So I think in the car, it was me, Nathan, Jerome from BBC Oxford and John Murray of the Oxford Mail. And I'm on the phone to Darren. I've got a mobile phone by then, Dan. I'm not quite as advanced as you, but I've got one by then. And I'm on the phone to Darren who's saying, they pulled it, we're not picking up Claridge, we're not doing it. I can't tell the others in the car they're doing it. Meanwhile, everyone's getting other calls saying they've sold the club. That, you know, what's going on. And we're trying to piece together this unbelievable day where they've sold the club, but not bought the stadium. The manager's not going to be there after the game. I, we get to Bury, and I try and compare notes with Darren Patterson, who's heartbroken because he knows it's his last game. He's not going to get these players in that he wants. And he held it together remarkably well. And Martin will take this story up. On the way back, I distinctly remember John Murray. We stopped for Petra and John of them at Oxford Mail doing a little dance, which is not something you ever want to see because Feroz had sold uh, and the club was out of his ownership. Do you remember him doing that, Nate? He, I think he danced, actually, and I hope John doesn't mind us saying this, he actually danced at Gig Lane. He did a jig at Gig Lane. Uh, yeah. Just after the press box, the call came during the game and we got the confirmation that it actually gone through and he was up on his feet and, you know, he'd had a bit of a rough time with with Feroz Kassam, to be fair as well, but he also had, a, you know, still does have a great affection for Oxford United, and that, you know, seemed at the time to be the right thing to do. Replacing the manager, well, I'm not so sure. Yeah, but um, we should say as well, Martin, lead, leader of the Grumpy Fan Group, what was happening? When did when did people storm the boardroom? Was that before? Well, that was uh, Darren Patterson's first game in charge, the Bristol Rovers game. Uh, well, there was a demonstration outside the ground, um, and then uh, I won't name names, but one or two of the more vociferous supporters at the time decided to take matters into their own hand and charged up that stairwell uh, into the, and into the boardroom. Uh, I wasn't there; I don't know what happened inside the hallowed halls, but uh, I'm assuming that they uh, made their feelings known. And uh, history says that you know, not that long afterwards, Firoz uh, Kassam. Sold the club to Nick Mary uh, for not a lot of money, but uh, for quite a lot of debt. Just to, um, if we're doing this as a historical thing as well, the night of the storming of the boardroom, there were two parts of that, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. One <laughs> group was, uh, there was a meeting in one of the lounges where the two directors, Brendan Cross and Bill Smith, sat and talked it through with a big group of fans. Meanwhile, the other end of the stadium, there were fans storming into the boardroom and putting up Kazam out stickers all the way up the stairwell, which one of Feroz's employees was taking them down three steps behind them as they went up there and stuff. So there were two ways that the fans were trying to mobilise to, to make this change happen, I think. It's funny, because we heard from the top of the, the south stand at the press box there, there's a, a staircase that winds back down from the press box down to the, to the lowest level, and we heard from the press area, the noise on the stairs getting louder and louder and all sort of peering over and you saw this band of fans coming up with the stickers and the screaming and the shouting. But it was quite the way that that noise just started off like sort of galloping wilderbeest coming over the horizon. It starts quite quiet and it gets louder and louder and louder and louder and suddenly they were 
a few had made their way right up and realized they'd gone the wrong way and were saying, no, this is the press area, boardroom's down there. No, sorry. And off they go back down the stairs again. But hearing them coming up the stairs was, was, was quite a thing. So I think that storming of the boardroom was the breaking point for Feroz. And I think there were, I, I think, I believe there were two or three potential buyers, but the only one um, with the money ready and available to buy the football club was Woodstock Partners, which is Ian Lanigan, uh, Nick Merry. So I don't know, you've got people storming up the, uh, the stairs trying to get at the boardroom, obviously angry fans. The crucial moment of, of Oxford's history he wants to sell the club, but the only person who can buy the club doesn't have the resources to buy the club and the stadium. So at that point, Oxford United's history changes forever. Dan, where were you around this time with the storming of the boardroom? As I said, I mentioned earlier, I kind of, I hadn't fallen out of love with Oxford. You know, Oxford will always be my team, will always like dominate my life. But at the time, I was just having a kind of bit of a conscious uncoupling, maybe. Is, is that how you describe it? Um, and I just, uh, it wasn't dominating my life. I've always lived in London as well. So, you know, for me to, to go to the Oxford match requires a lot of effort. You know, it was a Wednesday night done as well in your defence, so you probably would have struggled to get there, I think, that night. I mean, I've, 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 done, I've done midweek games. You know, I've done lots of midweek games in my life. It's just, it's a hassle. And it's a, a ball, can I say a ball ache on this? It's a sort of ball ache. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I was also working a lot. Uh, I worked for, I worked in a, a broadcasting company at the time and I was doing a lot of shift work. So I wasn't responsible. I didn't charge up the stairs, if that's what you're asking. I didn't put any Kassam stickers out, Kassam out stickers anywhere. Um, but I remember watching this from afar just thinking, I hope this works out. I really, really hope this works out. And obviously when you know, Jim Smith was announced and there is that kind of wave of emotion. It's like, you know, such a, you know, such a kind of key person in Oxford United's history, coming back and you think, this might be great. But there's also, especially when he starts announcing a whole lot of new signings, you start to think, hold on, I, ho you know, I hope this works out. Martin, how many players did he sign? Can you can you fill us in on that? Um, I can't remember the exact figure, but there was, uh, certainly there was Gratelli, the giant Italian goalkeeper. There was um, Liam Horsfield from uh, Portsmouth. Horsted. Yeah, Horst, Liam Horstead, that's the man. There was Chamna Toya, there was uh, Jay Smith, uh, and there's one more I can't re recall. But, uh, well, there was there was Scott Gemmell, who came in for half a game at Mansfield. That's right, yes, at Mansfield, and yeah. went to Australia the next day to play over there. I mean, that yeah. Was crazy. It was, you just remember thinking, you know, Darren Patterson kind of sorted out an 11 that looked solid and had picked up some points, and then suddenly it was all changed. The first, the first game, though, went really well. Um, again, apologies for the terrible footage, but this is all that exists at the moment. You should have done the, should have had the commemorative DVD that I produced. You promised you were going to send it to me, but you failed. A win. 10 seconds of Sky footage there. Um, thanks for the copyright, Sky. Um, just to go, that's a sellout. There's the, the grounds full. That didn't used to happen. We used to be getting crowds of, I don't know, four or five thousand. Martin looked no that better than me. I don't know. Yeah, it was more than brilliant in those days, was it? But suddenly we get a sellout and we get that and we make a DVD. And um, if you drive up to the Kazam now, Jim's face is still on the sign, isn't it? As you drive up, a stencil yeah. of Jim from there. In that moment, I remember throwing down from the PA box down to Rosie announcing Jim coming back out. And that moment, that was a real hairs in the back of your neck moment, wasn't it? That, that's Jim Smith back at Oxford United. It, it was a brilliant moment and it did, there's no doubt it had that, that groundswell of emotion and support again. And it was a real feel good moment. And from that point of view, uh, it's a brilliant almost PR move. It was fantastic. Maybe Jim coming back and Darren staying and Jim being, you know, figurehead might've been best. And, you know, I'd never want to speak of Jim Smith at all but it just a bit like what's the same with seals he may be the right man but just not at that particular time and the players that martin mentioned he brought him were not players who were ready for a relegation dogfight at that level and he would invest in the football club they're coming in with three or four games of the season to go with no history knowledge of oxford united what it means to anybody yeah they're professional players but they had absolutely no affinity 
they weren't going to be coming here the next season either. It was very much we're coming and yeah, that's fine. And Darren Patterson knew that before the players that he could trust at that point and kept some clean sheets. I just think it was too much change to ever work in that short space of time. The, the, Rosie had hairs on the back of his head to go up at that point, but um, <laughs> he actually said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Faroz Kazam has left the building. Here's Oxford United. And he hadn't, had he? No. Oh, no, don't put the league table and ruin my afternoon. Well, I mean, we're safe. We're safe, aren't we, at this point? Yes. We've got seven games left, and we are seven points clear of the bottom two. Um, Chester are down. They've lost 16 out of the last 19 games. Uh, Rushton are down, effectively. I mean, they're a, they're a horrible team anyway. Good riddance to them. Torquay also really struggling. Everything. We're, we're safe at this point. Surely we're safe. Mm, who was the manager of Torquay at the time? Atkins had gone to Torquay and had got them organised. And a certain Mark Wright had gone to Chester City as well, which was an added, like, Slight worry. Mm. Well, I've written down here, funny enough, in that situation, if you bring in Ian Atkins, again, you probably stay up at that point. And you say the table's looking healthy and we know what, what's to come, but you'd scrap out enough points to keep in the division as well. And it's easy to, to say that now, looking how healthy it was and how badly it went after that, but you don't lose that number of games with an Atkins sort of person bringing in, if you're going to make change, you bring in pe people that weren't fans' favourites, Andy Crosby, Matt Bound, Dave Waterman, Paul McCarthy, those sort of players, they come in and you stop conceding goals and you grind out results and you're still in that, you're still in the Football League next season. Martin, here's one of your questions. Uh, yeah, Trav Natoya, uh, scored on his debut after arriving from Rotherham. He later played for Maccabee Herzliya in Israel, alongside which other former United player? Yes. They can only yeah. be one. Oh, I thought you might get that one, Chris. No, they can only be one, can't they? I think. You thought so. So I'll if repeat that for the people on the that one. If, anyone, hey? if, if anybody at home gets that, I will knit you a scarf out of Martin's beard and send it to you. Ooh, yeah. do I right, get that? I've got it as well, because if I have, I don't want to get it right. No, change <laughs> the answer. I'll just read it again for those on the podcast. Cham Natoya scored on his debut after arriving from Rotherham. Uh, he later played for Maccabi Herzliya in Israel, alongside which other former United player? It's good you've got all-inclusive questions that anyone can play along with in this market. Well, I like to think that I'm getting, you know, good, you know, spread of different knowledges going here, you know. Hmm. Might be so a bit niche. Safe, we, can, we can end this podcast with we're safe in full. And that last graphic before Martin's ridiculously difficult question, 45 points in the middle of March. You've got to be quite unlucky to go down having got to that point total by then, haven't you? And I've talked about, you know, Jim's signings. And Toya, actually, when he get four goals in eight games, that that's that's decent going. And, you know, he missed some shockers during that run as well. But that, it, again, should have probably been enough. But it's going back to that fact that they just couldn't keep these keep, keep sheets. Move on. Again, apologies for the footage here. Um, it's obviously taken straight from VHS by somebody. Uh, we are away at Mansfield. Controversy at Field Mill after Gus Unenbeek's cross was flipped onto Danny Reed. Did that cross the line? Appear to have been kept yeah. out by Oxford Italian keeper Andrea Butelli. Any memories of, at all of this game? I, I must confess. Yeah, with your dubious footage, is that the one where Guatelli is? Oh, there I am. That must be the Russian press officer. Um, did um, did, did Guatelli catch that ball and walk back over the line? That's what happened. No, it's the one where he was stretching back and palms it out when it was hard to see from from where it was my memory of that game was pre-match and it was only Jim's second game wasn't it and I, I went down to get the team off him on the pitch and you know Jim being Jim did not know half the names of the players <laughs> and he said to me it's, um he said the new lads in goal so obviously that's Guitelli and he went Nigel bomb bomb bonnie county and I'm thinking to myself who the hell is Nigel? <laughs> and for the whole interview I'm just thinking I don't I've missed I've missed a signing I've I've, I've dropped something here and we stopped required to say to him, Jim, Nigel. And he went, yeah, you know, um, Mansell. I went, oh, his name's Lee. He went, that's him. I call him Nigel. And off he went. <laughs> Just, that was Jim. It was brilliant, down to a T. And, you know, he had no idea. The name of, he, you know, knew who they were by face. But to, to Jim, he was Nigel. And that was it. Younger fans should also watch Carl Robinson before any game now do his substitutes to Nathan. Because it's very much the same thing, isn't it? 
obviously a big, big defeat there. And then this one really was a hammer blow. So this is Chester who'd lost 16 out of 19. They then appoint Mark Wright as manager, who we'd sacked three years earlier, maybe. Um, and he's suddenly got them winning. And they're, they are in the middle of a five game winning run when they come here. Met at the Kassan Stadium. So no real surprise that just one goal settled it. And no surprise scrappy about game, either. scrappy goal. Now has six in three Another matches. defeat oh, sorry, no. down at the bottom. Derek Asamoah with the goal, yeah. Panicking now, gents? No, I honestly wasn't. I remember it. I still thought that was okay. We'll win another game sooner or later. There's still time to change it. Okay, um, another question for you. Which former Oxford player lined up for Chester against United in that game that we've just seen? Former Oxford player played for Chester against Oxford in that game. Another defeat. Now, I remember this game, uh, and certainly reading about it in Chris Hargreaves' book, this is a game where everything went wrong. They took a wrong turning in the bus and got stuck in traffic and didn't turn up till just before kickoff. We then turn up and we've obviously brought our yellow shirts and our black shirts, I think, as a backup, and then discovered that Boston are playing in yellow and black. So we have to wear Boston's shirt, oh, the Boston's away shirt. And We hit the bar, there's a goal mouth scramble, but we lose again. Jim had been manager at Boston, the first ever club, wasn't it, Boston? And uh, I remember standing there after the game, he was looking around the bar, and he said, I painted this in the 60s, and they painted the they were in supporters bar there, so that would have really hurt him. We couldn't see a thing, of course, because we were behind the goal, weren't we, Nathan? It was that season? Yeah. It was always behind the goal at Boston, wasn't it? No, we had at one point, we were able to to sit behind the dugouts for at least one game. I've done a game behind the goal. There's one game we had the misfortune of sitting behind the dugout and listening to the instructions and the language of, at the time, with Boston's coaching staff. And I'll leave it here well, to who we're talking about. But an individual and his assistant, I have never heard. And we've talked about the uh, reaction to the tackle on, on Burgess from your Rushton man, there was stuff that was even worse than that being said. But I don't know if it's that game or not, but certainly I've done one game at Boston where we had the misfortune and just been just behind the benches. But yeah, they're mostly behind the goal. And I've got no memory of that game whatsoever, the, the defeat of Boston. That's just, you take one look at that and you try and forget it, don't you? Because all games going to Boston were horrendous. Younger fans, the man walking towards Jim Smith in that footage, I believe is Steve Evans, the Boston manager at that time. I, it might be Rayner. Is it I think that's Rayner. It's Rayner, yeah. And that's Jim Rodney. Yeah. I think that's even was in the bottom left corner with the suit on. Things are looking really bad. So we're now with three games left in the season. We're in trouble, it's safe to say. Um, then we're facing high flying Northampton at home. Um, and again, things not going well. In action, and Oxford hovered just above Torquay, down amongst the almost dead men. More days like this will see them really worried. Chris Doyd got Northampton started. Well, Billy and Tilly back in goal for this one. Charge at the moment. Their mission yesterday to cement second place with a sixth win in seven games. They got it at a yeah, counter. It. Martin Smith doubled the lead. And then just two minutes later, Josh Lowe headed a third after some soft, soft defending. Quite simply, Northampton. It wasn't just that we were after that, terrible. No it was the other teams as well. That was what was really spinning to thread. All these teams have been said and buried all season. We're now picking up lots Oxford and lots and lots of points. And it was the uh, Ian Atkins thing. It was the Mark Wright thing. It was just suddenly this awful feeling that events were conspiring against us. This was almost something beyond our control. What was the feeling like at the club, Chris, at the time? Still, we were going to get out of it. I don't, I, I'll, I'll honestly, I'll, I'll hold this. There's not many of us left from behind the scenes then, but. I still 
maintain that until after, until the Wrexham, even after the Wrexham game, which is soon after this, we thought we were going to get out of it. Uh, the Wrexham game kind of killed it off, and we'll come on to that. But even the day of the last day of the season, we thought we were going to get out of it. And I would, I would also argue that we have the players not to be in that situation. So it's just this mad loss of confidence and form and everything. I mean, Hargreaves had a great career down at that level. Bash scored goals. and There were players... Burgess was a very good player. He upset fans when he left, but there were a lot of good players in that team. So quite how they managed to get relegated, I do not know. Chris Wilmot was an established centre, wasn't he? Leo Roger he came with a, a pretty big reputation, one who perhaps didn't have his best time at the club as well. So, yeah. You know, Quinn... Did Mansell was player of the year? It wasn't he had a decent season despite the relegation. I think yeah. there were enough players, whether they were the they didn't gel enough as a, as a unit, I don't know. But there were there were there were good players in that lineup. I think you're right, Chris. But at this point, the confidence they're losing game after game now, and to sides as you say, Chris uh, Dan says around us and for managers etc. Then of course on comes Dennis Smith for managers, isn't it? Uh -huh. We have to be careful how we phrase this because Dennis has been on with us before and talked about it. If ever a manager wanted the away team to win and not his side, it was this game, wasn't it? Yeah. He made some changes into his side and all sorts, and it was there. The game was there. Indeed, there were changes all around the pitch. He gave people debuts. He played Dennis Lawrence the centre half as a centre forward. He subbed off their best players, and they still beat us. That was Gortelli, wasn't it? Spilling that one. Um, I did. I went to this one because I'd reached the point where I was like, "Oh my God, we're in such trouble! I'm, I'm going to have to start really making the effort again." So I went to went to Wrexham. Gortelli, I don't wish to diss any player, but that looked like kind of an injury that he just wanted to appear injured, just get off the pitch. It was such, everything was just a disaster this game. Um, Burgess missed a couple of sitters, didn't he? I think he hit the bar as well with a really good effort from like 30 odd yards. Um, Burgess missed a really good chance from just a few yards out, an absolutely brilliant chance on that one. And they'd had obviously Gratelli, Turley had come back, they'd recalled Gratelli again, I think, for that game. He said, then he gets injured, dropping the cross. Chris Tardiff's on the bench then, and he comes on. It's I know, gave Tardiff, the last three games. I gave Tardiff a lift home because his wife went into labour during that game, so he came back with me. But, you know, three for the last three games of the season, you used three different goalkeepers. That in itself, again, is a worry, isn't it? But here we are. Um, looking at that, you think we're down. But because, was it Torquay and Stockport were playing against each yeah. other on the last day of the season? There was, there was some strange combination of things where, um, yeah, basically we weren't mathematically down. If we won, we, we could stay up. Or if we won, we were definitely up. Yeah, if we won, right? we definitely stayed up. That's right, yeah. And I was I, I, I was the one up behind the scenes at Wrexham telling people we weren't down. They all thought they were down at Wrexham. And I was the one, because I had a mobile phone, I could actually work it out and see that we weren't mathematically down. But I think we probably knew by now we were going to struggle. I remember coming to the press day the following week. There was a big press day and I was working in the media at the time, working for BBC Sport. And I came along and we were filming was it a new training ground that that week, Chris? Was it Milton, maybe? Yeah, we went to Milton. Did we go that quickly? I can't remember, but I remember everyone saying, "Oh, this is you know, this is new and exciting." We're at Milton, so maybe something Jim had just arranged in time for that week. But I remember the pitch being really, really, really bobbly. And in the warm up or in the in the shooting session they were doing in the training session with all the cameras, all the nation's cameras on, they were missing absolutely everything. And Jim Smith was effing and blinding and you could see the players were just absolutely broken at the time and I left that training session thinking oh my god they're you know we're, we're not staying up here we are not staying up I watched that with you and well Tardif kept saving everything he took Tardif out and left an empty goal and they still couldn't hit it <laughs> it's just true that's not that's not made up that's true um it was awful I had another slight issue in my life at the time which was my wife worked for a London football club and that London football club is Leighton Orient 
and I'd spotted this end of the season coming earlier on in the season. And I remember thinking, I really hope there's nothing riding on that match. I really hope there's nothing riding on that match. And of course, we reached this stage. Leighton Orient, last day of the season, we have to win to stay up. Leighton obviously also needed a win themselves to go up, which added a certain dynamic. Yeah, it was difficult times in my household, let's say that. Good times in all of our households. Nathan, what was, um, I, can rem I can remember what I was feeling the morning of the game and walking up to the ground. So what were you feeling? I think sick, usually. That's how you feel in these games, isn't it? But it's a funny one. It's, it's going to come after the game. I think there's a point where you, you almost, you don't switch off the fan, but there's that point if you have a job to do. And I certainly had that after the game. I remember being on the pitch Sorry to sort of, you know, spoil the ending, uh, but being on the pitch, interviewing Steve Basham, and Bash was, he was in tears pretty much. And people always say, oh, you know, players don't care, enough, blah, blah, blah. They all show in different ways, but Steve Basham very much, you know, still an Oxford United man. He, and he was in tears, and I'm talking to him, and I just, I felt for him at that point, not for me as a fan or the club or anything else. God, this is, you know, this is your career. And it was only afterwards when we've cleared the kit down, because you, you have a job to do, and we've all got places to be, and you're running around getting the audience, trying to make things happen. It's only when we clear down, and it's a lot with football matches, whether it's good or bad, it's when you clear down and the stadium's empty, that's when it hits me. And we actually had a drink myself and Nick and Jerome in one of the uh, executive boxes, and we just sat there about, what time it was, seven, half past seven. And that's when the reality of what had just happened kicked in, and we're, you know, we're no longer a football league club. But it wasn't, in, it, I was angry and upset and everything else at full time, but it didn't really kick in until after. And that was the same before the game. You, you have your mindset of what you've got to do and it almost can just push away those feelings of what could happen. You have to focus. Um, before we look at the highlights, Martin, just want to do your question really quickly here. Yeah. Uh, so the Orient game sets an as yet unbeaten crowd record at the Kassam Stadium. Um, mainly due because there's no segregation involved. So uh, we've got game since then, Alex segregation. That season also saw a new record low crowd, which has since been beaten um, at the ground. Who were the opponents for the game that saw the record low crowd? Should we watch the dreaded action? Um, I remember so little about this game, bizarrely. Um, I did remember taking the lead. That was Saban again. And that's where it ends, people at home. Oh. <laughs> if only. Um, I think that's the one you were talking about earlier on, Chris, wasn't it? Where is it? Is that Turley carrying it over? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Is no, that... uh, there was no. Good, good Turley carried one over at Manfred. He stepped back over the line. Bill's done his best to save that. He's... Elvis wouldn't do that on purpose. Is that Gary Alexander for Orient as well? Yeah. Swindon guy. By this point, are we down to 10 men at this point, Martin? No, no, right, because it's it's a lot that scored the goal up. there gets sent off later. Oh, sure. yes. He's, so Motsi scores a goal and yeah. then does this. So the camera misses it. Um, in researching this, I ended up watching a latent, because there's, there's not very much footage of this from an Oxford perspective. Um, I ended up watching a latent or review of this match and they were talking to two of the players involved. Uh, and they said that, uh, that Motti had whacked him in the face off camera. That's obviously a latent point of view. I, I don't so know if that's Chris true. Wilmot is, he was a very good player. He was very mild mannered, very calm. It would be completely out of character, but then it's out of character for me to lamp the press officer at Russian Diamonds, isn't it? So <laughs> emotions too much. Now, I want to say something about that goal as well, because Lee Steele has had such a bad press for scoring that goal and celebrating it as a former Oxford player. He could not have been more gracious afterwards. He was basically crying for us. He was the first one to seek me out and give me a big hug and say, you know, and, and my boy who was in tears as well. Steely was magnificent behind the scenes. It's not his fault that he scored the goal. I, I feel he it always gets the, this terrible press from the fans for scoring that. What was he meant to do? We have you know to what? celebrate the goal that takes your team up as well. I think. Yeah. I think on that, I was talking to Matty Taylor after he scored the goals against Bristol Rovers and he'd celebrated he recently at the Kassam and you, you sort of say, 
isn't it nice to see players now at celebrating a goal? It's what they're paid to do against the former club because so many players don't do it. So I, you know, I think if you're going to, we celebrate Taylor doing it against Rose, oh, isn't it great scoring goals against the old club? You have to, you know, it's the same as you say for Lee Steele. It's, I think it's harsh to, to, to pick him out and to abuse him for that because it, it's his job and he scores a goal and it's taking Orient up. And the fact that it's Oxford United in that split second you'd be a heck of a person to not celebrate that goal at that moment. It, that's human nature, isn't it? That's instinct. But typical it's him. <laughs> how do we all reflect on this season then? Right, it's gone now, hasn't it? I mean, it, it is what it is. It's part of the club's history. In some ways, you could argue that, like you were saying before about the club, had needed a change. You could argue that this was the catalyst for that change, going down to the conference. Well, if you remember that first season, we had brilliant crowds following us everywhere. We had a 19-game club record and beat and run at the start of that season. Uh, reached the playoffs for the first time in the club's history. You could argue that it was partly the catalyst that for what we have now, really, you know, for a club that's on the fringe of the playoffs in League One. Uh, my, my memory is, and it sounds like a cliche, having to look at map to find out where some of the places were we would be going to. And then the rude awakening that our results weren't in the papers, the results weren't you, you had to search. You actually you had to search out to find out where the tables were and stuff. It was it was horrendous. You hadn't it wasn't part of what you were expecting to do for Oxford United, the club of our status that season. Personally, I saw it as an experience. I I'd never want to experience that again. But I'm, I'm very much of the well, we've done that now. I've learned from that. Let's never do that again. But let's let's move on from it. But that day, I just felt completely hollow. I think we were hollow for days and days, didn't we? It was just a, a horrible season. You look back today at some of those those highlights and the things that have gone wrong and the obvious mistakes that have been made, and it all comes back to you. But funny enough, on Chris's point about the uh, the non-league stuff, we went. Remember going to Droylsden yeah. on the Saturday night kickoff on Satanta Sports, and I'm going to the game with Jerome that day, and we were listening to one of the local radio stations on the way up. So this would have been. I don't know, quarter to four, maybe earlier. I think they're doing the half, they were doing the halftime scores, so about quarter to four. And they read out it's nil nil at half time between Draws and Oxford. They didn't even realise it was a late kickoff. They just assumed it, it, it was nil nil. That's how unimportant those games were. And that's how low United had fallen and how low we felt at that point. And you trace it all back to that, to that afternoon as well. For me, it was a really weird time. As I said, that's having kind of an in, the, in our relationship with Oxford at the time. And what I really, this moment was the moment that was like, I have to make or break here. This is like, I'm either going to walk away and leave them or I'm going to have to throw myself fully back into the club and start properly supporting and properly going to matches again. And I probably went to more games the following season in the conference than I've been to in years and years and years and years. And it rebuilt my love for the club. I think, you know, we'd reached that lowest moment. We'd reached the lowest ebb. We can't go any lower than this, although we 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 had three or four seasons in the conference but it was that it was that moment where i just thought you know they need they need our fans now they need our support now um so in some ways this this match kind of rebuilt my my love of the club it it was a turn, massive turning point i also and people overlook this jim had only had eight games dozen games don't know not even a quarter of a season i suspect to, to turn it around and in my heart I could have walked away, I worked for the club, I could have gone, okay, I'm not doing it in the conference, I'll, I'll go and get a proper job. But there's a bit of you thinks, Jim Smith's back, we've got our own club, for us doesn't own the football club, we've got a future here, and that's how you always have to think, there's always got to be something positive that's going to come out of the whole thing, I think. Indeed. Didn't think that at the time, I just cried. But... <laughs> I remember after this game, I would, um had to go on a pre-scheduled uh, interview with, uh, I think it was, uh, it might have been the BBC Oxford, or it might have been national BBC, but on, on the TV. And I was there with my son at the time. Uh, so obviously this one, my son, but uh, I think he was eight years old then. And uh, he was crying his eyes out. I was sort of choking. I couldn't, I couldn't go through the interview because I was just sort of, everything was just sort of choking up. And this uh, bloke kept asking me these questions. And I just uh, really just wanted to get away from there. I didn't want to be involved. That's pretty... The worst interview I've ever done, and there's been quite a lot of competition for that. I left the ground with my dad and my son, and I said to I said to my son, who was very upset, 
one day it'll be us celebrating on that pitch. Don't worry, we'll come back from this and we will be out there celebrating. So then, I don't know, the Wickham game many years later when he's dancing around and making a fool of himself on the pitch, it all gets vindicated because it does go in circles, doesn't it? Yeah. But at some point, obviously, United get relegated again. At some point, we win a promotion again. It all goes around in a big circle. It's funny how we often say, isn't it? You know, after defeats and you come out, it's not, you know, it's not as bad as that day. And you, I think you forget how bad that day felt every time. When you say that glibly, so, oh, well, you know, we've lost a, a playoff semi final. So, oh, it's still not as bad as, you know, don't forget, you know, it's, you can't feel any worse than that. And at the time, you, you do feel bad. But watching that back again now and just thinking about it, that does actually stand true. That is. That is the lowest of the low, isn't it? That feeling of dropping out of the football league, the way it happened, and with Jim in charge as well. That was that was sad too. The, the legend of Jim Smith couldn't save us that season, and it does make you think that sometimes a defeat at Rochdale on a, on a Tuesday night isn't, you know, isn't the end of the world in a footballing sense. Hey. I'm still writing down quiz questions, quiz answers. If I just thought of another team, hey. well, they for us. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they weren't just. Let's just move on to the next podcast now. Should we do the answers or have you got more footage for us then? No, that's what other footage could there be other than Martin crying on TV and uh, me sitting in the car and my wife out. coming home, <laughs> not talking about Orion. I would actually again. I would actually like to see the footage of Martin crying on TV. Though. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't dig that one out, Dan. Um, yeah, I'll, I, I <laughs> saved your embarrassment there. Thank you. Honestly, uh, can I just say as well, for those who are still watching and who haven't, you know, been this bog, this podcast for even more, if you have got any footage of Oxford United on VHS or on the DVD or even one of those club memory sticks, stick it onto YouTube because, you know, technology is, is passing by and sooner or later your VHS will not be playable anywhere else. So if you have got some old footage of Oxford United, let's try and get a really, really good, like, archive of it somewhere on YouTube. And if we're on, the, if we're doing this as well, if there are fans who want to come on and talk about it, maybe not this season, but uh, other seasons, like we had the guests the other week, just let us know. We can come in and talk and uh, either drown your sorrows with us or, or relive the good bits. Right, come on then, Boris. What are the answers to this silly quiz? Yeah, end of the show. This is what bit you'll be hanging on for us while you've stayed with us this long. What's your um, question? The first question, uh, which you've had all all show to think about. There are 11 sides in League Two that season that are no longer in the Football League. They are. Hold on, let's do it. Well, let's shout them out. Okay, let's shout right. them out. Should we go in? in or, so I'll do one. Rushton. Yep. Torquay. Yep. <laughs> Darlington. Correct. York. York went in League Two that season. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh. Try again. Rexham. Rexham's correct. Boston. Yeah, I gave you that one at the start. Yeah, but it's true. Stockport. Sorry? Who, who, I must turn it who's going. It was Stockport. Yeah. Yep, Stockport's correct. You just said Dunn, didn't you, Dan? Yep. So we'll take that off. Um, Notts County, no. Notts County, there's still two more to get. Hartlepool. Nope. Berry. Yes. Yeah, one more. Rushton. Well, someone, someone said Rushton already. Are they? And Diamonds. <laughs> oh, and Diamond. Yeah, she's not around anymore. Chesterfield. No. Charlie Chester. Ends in field. Torquay, we done. It's near yeah. Chester and it ends in field. Mansfield. Not that Mackles, one. Macclesfield. Correct. Yeah. Oh, this is ridiculous. Right. And the supplementary question to that was which sides are now in League Two that weren't in the EFL in 2005 and 6? Eight. Salford. Eight. Salford's one. Is it Accrington? No, they're in League One at the moment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bolton. No. Stevenage. Stevenage is one. Oh, very good, Chris. Crawley. Yeah, you, you already mentioned them in connection with Lee Bradbury. Yeah, they're one. Isn't that all of them? How many is there? Read, read them out, Martin. Hey. We're going to be here all night. Yeah. Okay, okay. Salford City, Harrogate Town. Crawley Town, Stevenage, Morecambe, Barrow, the Vegan Boys, Forest Green Rovers, and Newport County. What was the question? Right. Next question. From which club did Lee Bradbury join Oxford? 
Anyone want to hazard a guess? Portsmouth. Portsmouth. No. No. Walsall. Walsall is the answer. Hmm. I'll tell you if that's a trick question. Why don't you give me clues? Yes. It wasn't a trick question. It was a straightforward answer. Trick question. We all said Portsmouth. <laughs> Next question was from which, which former Oxford player lined up for Chester City against Oxford in the game away at Chester? Phil Wayne Hatswell. Scott McNiven. Scott McNiven is correct. Uh, uh, for three points, um, two players made their debuts for Oxford at Russian and Diamonds and one player made his final appearance for the club. Name the three players. Dempster. Yeah. Burgess. No. Nope. Roach. Roach made his last game for the club. Which other player made his debut in that, that game? That's the correct answer. Why are you dismissing my correct answer? No, I said Neville Roach played his final game. That's the that's correct answer. Correct. Is it Ben Whedon? It's not Ben Whedon. Hmm. The answer is Yemi Odebade. Oh, God, yes. Rise with Lemonade. Yes. Or not. Um, after leaving Oxford, which teams did Lee Bradbury, Chris Hackett and Craig Davis join? Southend. Southend. Southend for Bradbury. Hearts. Hearts. For Chris Hackett. Um, Italy, I've written here. Verona. Ooh. Do you have their last name? Verona Hellas is the answer. There's two teams in Verona. The one he joined was Verona Hellas. Martin, are you giving Nathan half a point for that? Well, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give him the whole point. Cool. Oh. What's the point otherwise? I said Italy, can I have half a point? They only made one appearance for Yeah, no. No, this is a big country. Lots of football teams in it. Uh, next question was, Tam Natoya, Cham Natoya scored on his debut after arriving from Rotherham. He later played for Maccabi, Maccabi Herzliya in Israel. Alongside which other former Oxford United player? Who's going to say it then? Who knows it? You say it, Nate. Is it Josh Kennett? It is Josh Kennett. You've yes, won well his done. beard. You've won his beard, Nathan. I feel very sorry for you. Yeah. yeah. I'll shave it off forthwith and send an email it to you. <laughs> the final question. The Orient game set an as yet unbeaten crowd record at the Kassam Stadium in all competitions. Last season also saw a new record low crowd, which has since been beaten at the ground. Who were the opponents in the game that where the record low crowd was? I know where you know it, then. Go on. Please, sir. Orient. has got a pen in the air. Yeah, what? Leighton Orient is the answer Leighton in the trophy. Yeah. Curtis's wife worked at Leighton Orient. That's inside knowledge. It is, yeah. Yeah. Dan doesn't get any points for any questions as a result. Also, Ms. Master, I've written Tardiff as an answer, but was there a question missing somewhere? There wasn't. No, it could have been which goalkeeper only had one F in his name, but no, mm. there wasn't a question about Tardiff. But good answer. Good. I, I wrote it down just in case. Yeah. Put it Wise in the precaution. The Tardiff question in, I can get a point. Do you want a total? Uh, if you want to give me one. No, I didn't write it down. Oh, ah, there have you I go. With your... more Chris. What happened? Have I won? No, I got more than you, but not as many yeah. as Dan, I don't you think. You didn't get as many as me. You've won a beers. You've got a prize. I, this is like Richard Osmond's house games. 17. 17. What, the man who did the slides got 17? Yeah. Well, I got all 11, all 11 of the clubs. Uh, plus Salford, plus South End, Hearts, Verona, Dempster, and Orient. So I got a point for Italy and one for Tyler. <laughs> so I, 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 I think Nathan wins. I think I win, actually. I knew all the answers. No. Definitely. Can I come back as a prize for next time? There's a nice season to talk about. Is that the best prize as opposed to Martin's beard? Yeah. That, that was Two very unfair. Very equivalent, very equivalent prizes, though. Nathan, what season would you like to do? Oh, can I think about that and come back to you? Don't put me on the spot like that. Yeah, it was very, very unfair to get Nathan to come and talk about a, what was a rotten season. And there have been two or three in our history, Martin. Is that right? Two or three rotten seasons? Uh, almost that many, yeah. yeah. Out of 127 or whatever. That's not bad, is it? Not uh, bad. We'll, be, we'll be back with a more cheerful podcast very soon. Nathan, thank you very much for your time. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Martin, thanks for nothing with the quiz. <laughs> You're welcome. We'll be back with uh, another podcast very soon.